Hey everyone, today is January 10th. This is the KCP community meeting. We do have an agenda for today. I will go ahead and paste a link to it in the chat. If you've got anything that you would like to ask, demo or discuss or anything else, uh, please feel free to add a comment to the agenda here. If you um, don't get a chance to, feel free to use the raise hand feature in Meet, and uh, we can call on you after we go through these items. So um, if you're new, welcome, and happy 2023. We usually save triaging incoming issues until the end of the meeting. So Stefan, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you do a demo of sharding. Yeah, so um, before I start, um, this is, of course, not uh, my work alone, right? It's of many people, especially Lukas and Frederick in the recent weeks, very active, um, giant teamwork. So with that uh, said, let's move to my terminal, one second. Now you should see something in a moment. Looking good. Yeah. Okay. So I have uh, KCP running. Um, this comes from a branch. Uh, we haven't merged all of it yet, but we are not far. So um, what I'm running here is basically everybody knows that already is a sharded test server, and this time it's it's really sharded. So we have a number of shards too. And um, yeah, in the logs here you will see there are. KCP one lines and KCP zero lines. Um, KCP zero is a root chart, everybody knows, and KCP one is another chart. And on the left, I have the uh, yeah, normal terminal Q pedal. And I'm at the moment, I guess, in roots. Yeah, I am. And if I if I look here around, then you see on the right side, you see the green, uh, you see the green lines, which are the proxy. The proxy redirects to the right chart, and you see. Um, every, every time I do something, KCP zero. So the so root uh, shard and the no, so, so root workspace is served by KCP zero at the moment. And um, what we can do now, we can create a workspace which is not on the root shard. So for that, we added uh, a flag to QPuddle, create workspace uh, called location selector. And that's just a, a, a label selector in the workspace object. And um, at the moment, the scheduler is still hard coded to root if we don't do anything. So every, everything lands on root, but we will change that uh, soon. So probably going to some, some random selection. But at the moment, you, you must be explicit. So you have to tell the system, I want to be on shard one. And we can do that. And I also enter the workspace here um, directly. This one I already have, let's call it demo and you see nothing special, a demo workspace is created um, and we have entered it. But this time when we do something inside, you see on the right uh, tab here, KCP one is serving the request. And the proxy knows about the new workspace. So it knows when it goes to clusters, root, colon, demo, uh, it will redirect to the logical cluster with this cryptic name here. And this comes from KCP one, so the second chart. And um, yeah, it doesn't look spectacular. It's getting more interesting when you, when you ask yourself um, how this actually works. So before I do that, uh, answer the question. So let's uh, do a bit more. Of course, we can get more demos here. So we are now in root demo, demo, demo. And all of them are on chart one. But of course, we can get another layer here and go back to root. And now we are back on the, on the root chart. So if we, if we do something, let me scroll down the locks, lots of locks, here it is. When we do something, we are back on root, on the root chart with this workspace. So when you see, so it's a hierarchy now, which is um, yeah, completely mixed, basically. Root is a root chart, first three demos are on chart one, and the last one is on the root chart again. So it's completely transparent, the user does not notice anything. But of course, it can be, um, yeah, different charts can live in different regions uh, at some point in time. And um, so lots of things happen behind the scenes. And let's, let's take a quick look 
um, what happens here. So when we go back to root, in, in root, um, we have a couple of things which matter for um, every workspace. So one is, for example, the workspace types. So you have seen here in the, in the history, um, here was a root universal workspace. So um, every, every one of those actually is a root universal. So what we have created is a workspace type, a workspace of workspace type universal. And this one is in the root chart. So something happens, obviously, in the background that chart one knows about the universal um, workspace type. And there are many more things which are pretty much invisible. Um, we have a pretty extensive authorization stack. So the stack will check that I, I'm allowed to use this type. Authorization will check um, that maybe you know this maximal permission policy topic that Sergio has talked about. It has to find those error codes uh, somehow and authorize against them. And there's some other things which we have to share to make this work. Um, the kubectl create command has to know, not, not the command, but the, the schedule behind when we do that has to know about shards. So all shards must be known as well. So a couple of things which uh, we have to somehow replicate among the shards. And so I, I, I've drawn a picture here which shows most of that before I show that one. Um, let's took, uh, take a look on this list here. So this is a list of resources which we replicate between shards at the moment. So we talked about the workspace types. Um, we talked about the shards themselves, um, the exports, the resource schemas, everything around um, yeah, binding uh, an API. And we talked about authorization, so everything around ABAC. Those objects we, we replicate between um, shards. And replicating between shards basically means that. So I've drawn here both shards. So on the left side, there's shard zero, which is called root and chart one is on the right side. In the middle, there's something we call a cache server. Um, a cache server is basically, it's a replica of the data which we replicate. So it, it holds all those objects which are relevant to all the shards. So it's a partial copy, if you want, eventually consistent of all the shards in the system. So in the spe special case here, it will copy lots of stuff from the root shard, from the root workspace on the root shard, into the cache server and chart one will use that as a second informer, which you see here, um, to do whatever it has to do, like authorization, do admission, do scheduling, everything. So the cache server is, is, is filled uh, with data by, by replication controllers. So the green boxes here are replication controllers. And um, every replication controller pushes data from the local shard, so in this case here on the left side, from shard zero into the cache server, and the right one will cache shard one data into the cache server. Um, the cache server, I won't go, go into de details here, it, it has a way to list watch by shard, and it has a way to list watch just by resource. So those green controllers here, they see only their data, and it's a simple, a simple controller which just copies data and deletes data. I think deletion is even not implemented at the moment, but it basically it sees only its own data in the cache and it replicates into that and uh, makes sure the objects are up to date and so on. So those screens, those screen controllers do this pushing from all uh, directions. We have another controller. If you if you go uh, if you look here, um, API resource schemas export shards and types. For those um, for those kinds, we we basically want all the objects, so we don't filter in any way. We just um, push everything with those green controllers into the cache. But for airbag objects, we don't need everything. We just need those which matter matter for authorization. So, for example, when we want to bind a resource, um, yeah, bind uh, an export, um, we have to check that we are allowed to bind and. Um, at the end, we have to, when we access uh, the resource, we have to check the maximum permission claims. So we know exactly which airbag objects we need. And we have a couple of special controllers, I call them label controllers here. Um, they label airbag objects which we want to share, which we want to replicate. So we label them, and then the green controller goes on and uh, copies them onto the cache server. 
Um, what else is interesting? Yeah, I, I mentioned it already. So um, we have an informer against a cache. So this, um, yeah, the cache informer here is this blue box, which talks to the cache server. And we have a local informer. That's the informers we, we have uh, had before already. But it's important that we have those two sources of um, information from listers. So admission and authorization, for example, and other controllers which need this information, they have two informers to look up data. So for example, when authorization wants to look up, um, um, I don't know, whether we can bind, for example, it will check first as a local informer, whether there's an airbag object, so it will authorize against that. Um, if permission, we will go to the cache informer and do the same thing. So and this is a pattern we have everywhere. So all controllers which uh, are cross workspace, they do the same thing. So we will wire in both controllers and um, uh, both informers, and those controllers have to check both uh, informers for information. Um, yeah, so, so last thing, this labeling, at the moment we have uh, an internal um, annotation, it's here in the middle, the red one, so it's internal KCPIO replicate. When this has a value which is not zero, not empty, then the green controller will continue and, and replicate those, those objects. You will see there is a comma separated list of words. And at the moment, we only have one of those label controllers, which is for the APIs, uh, API group. And it just puts the APIs.kcpio into that uh, annotation, but it can be a list. So there can be multiple label controllers, one for API, APIs, uh, API group, another one for tenancy, another one for TMC. So you can imagine there are many reasons why we want to replicate something. And then this will be a list, a comma separated list. Yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to talk about. And yeah, I didn't mention that, of course, the cache server is also etcd based. So it can serve informers. That's why we use etcd, but um, that's not set in stone. I think the, the most important bit here is the programming model, which uh, is behind all, all of that. So the cache informer is a second informer. And this is a different kind of programming to, I mean, compared to normal controllers in Tube. And um, how it's implemented, we need something we can just watch with global information. That's basically the, the most important pattern here. All right, that's all I wanted to show. Very cool. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, that was a lot. And I'm sure it'll take folks some time to digest. But if anybody does have some questions right now, uh, please feel free to hit the raise hand button. And if not, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, yeah, just basic understanding here. Did you say the cache server is not a regular API server and the cache informer is not a regular um, it's, informer? Yeah, it's the informer is a regular informer. Um, the cache server is based on uh, on API extensions, but with some hacks, um, it doesn't have to be a regular, I mean, it doesn't have to be based on this code base. But at the moment, we just do that. It's it's an API server which has to serve this watch and can create and update objects. Thank what you. we use behind the scenes doesn't really matter. Of course. Maybe w one point here, which is interesting. We haven't tried that yet, but the theory is everything we have done here, you can switch off the root chart. And chart one should have everything necessary. As long as the cache server is up and chart one itself, of course, and that's the chart one can serve information. That's very important. So imagine the root chart is in a different region. It goes down or latency is high or network uh, latency goes up or something. This doesn't matter because we have replication, replicated data in the cache server. And also imagine um, at the moment it's one cache server. So we haven't investigated any any time here, any, anything to, to uh, replicate the cache server itself. You can imagine to have a cache hierarchy of some kind. So one per region and they exchange data or something like that. So where is the proxy in this picture? Uh, it's not there. The proxy is at the bottom outside the screen. So basically in the middle at the bottom, imagine there's a proxy and it, it uh, forwards requests either to the left or to the right. So that would sit like outside of, so a shard is like a KCP instance? Is that the, like the right way of thinking yes, about it? Yes, a shard is just KCP start, if you want. Right, um, and then so the proxy sits outside of 
Like is it being exactly. The, the, the proxy sits outside <laughs> and the proxy, at the moment, it watches all logical clusters and all workspaces. And from that, it can build tables internally, like in-memory tables, which can be used for lookup. So when you go to root demo, as uh, I have shown, it will know root demo belongs to shard one and it belongs to logical cluster that F eight five or something. All right. Um, why don't we move on to our next topic, which is Joachim demoing pod sub resources support. Are you ready, Joachim? Yes. Let me share the terminal. Uh, um, okay. So let me see if the the size is is good enough. Yeah. I think it looks good for me. Okay. So I've done some setup before the demo. So here, what I'm doing, I will show you that we are in a normal workspace, nothing special. Uh, then I will get the same targets. As I have previously set up one, one same target. We have a Kubernetes cluster running. And well, what you're going to see is basically how transparently we can access Lo uh, the logs from from a pod that's running on the Kubernetes cluster from KCP. So here in KCP, I have a deployment created. Okay, so if we check now uh, in our Kubernetes cluster, we will see that we have this pod quad tunneler created into that namespace. So um, Accessing the sub resources joins a lot of uh, different components in KCP. So what we need to do is take this pod that's running on the downstream um, Kubernetes cluster, and we need to upsync it into the KCP. Into KCP. Okay. So KCP uh, will never create pods, but the syncer will get a running pod on Kubernetes, and then create it on uh, KCP and keep it in sync. This is something that is not ready yet. So it has been a manual step. Let me show you uh, the manual step. What we are doing here, just um, stop me at any time for questions. I know this is perhaps confusing, but what we are doing here is basically getting the pod name that has been created downstream. Um, the destination in KCP of the pod, and then we populate some of the information, then sync target key. And how do we create that pod? Well, this will be done by the syncer, but we use the virtual workspace called AppSyncer. So basically constructing the proper URL, that's something that, of course, the user doesn't need to know anything about constructing the proper URL, we will create that pod, okay? So it's already done. So if I go here and list the pods in KCP, we will see that we have the Quart Tunneler uh, pod created in KCP. It's not ready, this is something because I didn't sync the status, but this is something that will be, okay, totally, uh, uh, automatic and, and done by the syncer soon, I guess. So what we can do now, uh, KCPK, it's uh, an alias of kubectl with the proper admin config. So what I'm going to do now is logs, and I will access the logs of the quart tunneler from KCP. Okay, so here we can see the, the the logs of the pod downstream. So uh, something I want to show is, for example, uh, 
let me show you the actual URL used to access this. Um, let me try. So what we are doing is API default port blah blah blah. So we are using the the basic. There is nothing magic. It's totally transparent. kubectl works as it expected. As we are doing internally a redirection um, to the proper syncer because thanks to the work that Antonio was doing with the tunneler, when the syncer starts, um, it basically creates an inverse connection with with KCP. It creates a connection to KCP, waiting for the user to ask for a pot, uh, a sub resource of the pot, for example. And what we do is when we get a request for, for a pot lock, we identify the sync target that we need to look for. And once we identify the sync target and everything is you know uh, properly in place, the authorization and everything, what we do is proxy the request transparently to the sync sinker running on the um on the kubernetes cluster get the pod and send that back to the to the user um of course uh well you can see sometimes there is some some issue uh well now now it's fine but uh sometimes there is some issue with the tunnel but that's my my demo setup um apart from that we can do an exec if we want of course we can exec and do uh id why on it's nobody so we are tunneling all the sub resources to the uh sinker running downstream all of these is feature flag um feature gate sorry is behind a feature gate even the sinker has a feature gate for this and KCP. So it's still, you know, we are working on that. But uh, we are setting, we have proper authorization. So we check that the user can access these logs and everything. And, and we control that with uh, roles. Let me show you quickly. Uh, sorry, KCPK get uh, role, uh, cluster roles, sorry, cluster roles. So we have this allowed tunneler cluster role. Let me show you. When we give access to only the sinker to access this special URL, which is internal and everything. I don't know. Any questions? Anything that you want to know more about? Uh, one question. Uh, is this uh, uh, access per sinker, the restriction, or can you do that per workspace? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. So, uh, um, yeah. I was asking whether the permission is uh, for a specific uh, sync target, or uh, you, you 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 will have multiple workspaces uh, using the same sync sync target, and whether you can have the, the permission per workspace, so that you know people having access to workspace A can access a lock of pod in this workspace, but not in uh, another one. We are relying on the workspace authorizer to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say yes. <laughs> okay. I would say that's that good. it works. <laughs> we are, <laughs> but we are working just now. We are expanding the end-to-end -end test to cover all those cases, just to make sure. You know, uh, sometimes the author, the all the chains of authorizers uh, still go uh, over my head a little bit. So. I will be able to to answer that in a week or so. <laughs> Maybe I would uh, ask um, add also something. Uh, it seems to me that we can distinguish two levels of um, authorization. One is um, the fact that 
an end user would be authorized to access the sub resource, you know, logs or exec on a pod. And this one completely relies to standard authorization in KCP because, you know, the end user access to accesses the standard REST URL uh, to, to the pod sub resource. So obviously, uh, and, and this is, and any redirection that finally end, uh, ends up in tunneling is done after the standard authorization in KCP. So that means that user one could not access the logs of uh, workspace two if he's not admin in the workspace two. Uh, but that's you know exactly the same as user one could not access even the pod description or definition in workspace two. So that's one level of authorization. And then there is the other one level, uh, the other level of authorization, um, which is related to sync targets, to the real uh, tunneling itself. And that's not per end user, it's per synchro service account. Because in fact, um, the only client, external client that will access the, you know, specific URL that uh, sets up the 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 tunnel and and do the connection and reverse connection this is in fact the sinker that's the whole point that there is an inversion of of you know initiative and so that's why and this there we have a a level of security where only the sinker only the service account of the sinker a will be able to tunnel um communication to pods for the sinker a so you know you will not have the ability to have a, a second sinker trying to connect to uh, any pod that that has been synced uh, or created on the physical cluster of of sinker a uh, it's so so that's the second level of authorization that is based on on such a, um, a permission that that Joachim showed and then there would be probably a third level of authorization that is still not implemented which would be um, at the um, uh, sinker uh, level directly. That means at the very end of the of the chain, um, you have some some network uh, 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 network traffic that comes into the sinker, uh, and and at this time we would also need to to have a, a third level of authorization here. But that's not not anymore on the KCP side, but but more much more on the single side, something uh, probably a bit more low level. Th does it answer? Oh, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very, uh, very good. And maybe just just one point. So the, the the only remaining thing apart from this third level of authorization is the ability to automatically upsync a pod that exists uh, downstream to upstream. Of course, we would prune the pod from many fields that are not necessary because we only need mainly the name of the pod, maybe or just some basic 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 stuff here. And so, pods on the upstream side would only be some sort of you know placeholders to know that the pod exists and to be able to access to the sub resource through the standard url and also to allow airbag uh, on it and so that's something that should launch in the in the next weeks uh, as soon as the the upsinker um, controller you know uh, is merged and yeah, obviously we would sorry sorry no no yeah okay. obviously we would sync only pods that are related to deployments which are known to be synced to this sync target so there would be some this this uh, you know small logic to identify only the minimal set of pods that should be absent yes that's a good point as you see the pod that we have here created in in kcp is in absync that's an important part of it but after that, the pod is uh, just has a container name trying to match the same as in the downstream cluster. But I guess we can choose to bring more information less or we'll see. 
Very cool. Thank you for the demo. Uh, it's very exciting to see that uh, the continuation from the prototyping from earlier last year. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we do have something from Mike. So let me get my screen up again. Uh, so Mike, you added generic API server repository feature. Would you like to uh, expand on that? Yeah, and maybe I used the wrong term. Maybe it's generic control plane. But this is uh, you know, regarding the issues of upstreaming the KCP work. Um, I know there's been some uh, not enthusiastic reception of everything, but you know, when we last talked about it, Andy, you said there's been an agreement on accepting some of the work in the form of creating a repo or library called I forget whether it was generic API server or generic control plane. Control plane. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So I was just wondering what's the status and and you know future uh, who's working, you know, what's to expect, what's going on there. Yeah, we're gonna write a cap, but I'll let Stefan uh, say a bit more. Yeah, basically we have two big tasks we want to execute on, let's say in Q1, Q2. Um, one is basically the cube site, which no knows nothing about uh, logic clusters, but everything which is in package generic control plane in our fork, this should become something official in cube, and cube API server should even build on that. So that's the first big task, and we have agreement from upstream that we can do that, and that we get the reviews and everything. Um, Prereq, as Andy said, a cap and presentation in the APIs, uh, a machinery SIG meeting and everything, so it's a normal process. The other task, task two, is basically building on top of that something, yeah, we want, probably we call it KCP core or something. So basically a generic um, API server, generic control plane, plus logical clusters. So this will include logical clusters as so a core types, which we have now as a repository and API export binding, but not much more. Nothing about hierarchy, nothing about workspaces. Really just um, yeah, those bits. Sharding will be there, but um, the higher level um, functionality is completely missing. So those are the steps we want to do. And whether we do another repository for uh, the second task, like for this core KCP, I don't think in the beginning because the monorepo just buys us uh, velocity, so we we are much faster doing that in one repository. But it will certainly be another um, CMD command and maybe a different sub hierarchy of the repository, something like that. We can talk about that. Nothing there is set in stone, but that's a rough uh, plan. All right. So for the first part, for the upstreaming work on the generic mm -hmm. control plane. Um, where do I find the generic control plane now? Does it exist now? It does. Uh, Andy, if you can, you can show it, if you like. Are you talking about our, in our work? Yeah. OK. So in the KCP fork of Kubernetes, we have package, and then we have generic control plane. And ah. the code that's in here is really a combination of two main packages that already exist, where we've um, pulled in the pieces that we need and re removed the pieces that we don't to make this more of a true generic control plane. But uh, I don't think this is final form. So we would be, uh, as I said, we'll, we'll do a cap. We'll, have more design around exactly what we want this to look like, as well as plans for phasing Cube API server over to using this. All right. Um, and so I won't ask you to write that cap on the call, but I just want to make sure I understand the you know, basic outline of the idea. Um, my recollection, my previous conversation with you was the idea is that this would be basically um, what's in the Kube API server. Um, minus the built-in types that are uh, responsible for containerized workload management. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting because you can either look at it as the Cube API server minus things or an API server with things. So ultimately, what we want is CRDs and 
the other things that are necessary, like namespaces and authorization, admission, um, RBAC. But uh, I wouldn't expect that you would see all the other things like like pods and deployments and whatnot. Um, so whichever way we go about it, the end result is approximately going to be the same. Um, but we do want it to be designed as cleanly as possible so that we don't carry forward things that are in the Cube API server that are in service to uh, pods and containers uh, and really have it be as clean as possible and minimal. Right. So I think that's what I was trying to say, and I realized I forgot an issue. Um, the Kube API server has really got three ways of serving requests. One is it gets shuttled to the code that handles built-in types. One is it gets channeled, shuttled to uh, code that handles resources defined by CRDs. And one is it delegates to an external API server. And uh, if I recall correctly, the idea for the generic control plane was that it would have two of those three options. Um, as well as omitting the built-in types concerned with the containerized workload management. Maybe even three. All of three. I, I, yeah, I see no reason to not have all um, three. My, my, my dream is that we, we build it in a way via those option structs that you can really disable everything you want. Like you get the full, what any basically enumerated, the full generic Cube API server experience minus the workload stuff. But if you don't want, for example, you don't want airbag and authorization for reasons, or you don't want aggregation, you should be able to, to switch it off easily. Well, isn't RBAC already an authorization module that can be switched on or off? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how, how deep you have to go to do that. Um, this I know there's a command line argument for, for turning on and off um, authorization modules. But you have the types in Cube API Server. You can that's change authorization, but the types are there. That's right. Right. All right. So anyway, let's see I, how, I, how, how far we get. Um, as modular as possible. That's the goal. OK. Great. Who's going to be working on that cap? Probably me and Stefan when we have time. Um, I would imagine Steve would be involved, too. Uh, but I mean, we'll, we'll accept help from anybody who's got time. Sure, I'll be happy to read drafts and, and give my comments. Um, so the next question then is, what about building a binary that's analogous to the KCP binary um, in that it that's, bundles this yeah. API server and the re relevant controllers? That's part of the plan, to have a CMD something, generic control plan binary or something. Yes. And is that something that Upstream has also accepted or said that they would, would accept? Yes, to my understanding, yes. But this is more like a proof. It's more like a smoke test that everything works. I don't think it's a product kind of thing. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, I've been long saying Kube API Machinery is good for more than containerized workload management. And I think there are people who would pick this thing up and use it uh, as soon as it was there. Yeah. But the goal is, the goal is really, it should be so simple to create your own CMD your own command with exactly what you want and what you don't want to just switch, switch off. That this pre-built command has no value. I mean, okay, it's there, but many people will just want to customize. That's also valuable. Um, so my question was just understanding what the upstream community has, um, you know, got by what what buy-in is there from the upstream community now, and I think I got my answer. So thank you. Okay, uh, so we will, of course, share any and all drafts and progress on that when we uh, get around to it. It's probably not going to be until the end of this month at the earliest, though, that we would get started. All right, um, any other topics before I move into looking at the issues? All right, let me go through these here. 14, uh, all right, we'll start at the top. And I know we talked about this uh, in December to make our website have documentation for older releases. 
uh, we do want to do that. So I'm going to put this in the backlog. Uh, if you're new and you, you haven't seen us go through the, these uh, issues before, the goal is to just triage them to decide, essentially, do they go in the backlog? Like We, we decide we want to do them at some point. Uh, or are they more critical and we, we put them in next? But that's kind of what we're looking to do here. Um, so Flake we need to deal with. I'm actually going to start putting Flakes in next unless you all disagree because they are are and have been annoying to CI. Yeah, yeah we can put that in, in next, sure. Um, the home doc page is not clear about the top level modularity. Yes, we will be doing this as part of the repo restructuring. Uh, allow maximum permission policy on native cube and KCP types. Um, backlog for this one, Sergius. I know you filed it. Uh, let me remind you what this was about. Do, 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 do. Honestly, I have to revise this one. <laughs> Give me some more time. I, I just okay, I'm going to leave it in new then. Thanks. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, confused about username permutations. This we can get rid of because we don't have buckets anymore, right? Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Uh, here's another flake. Let me just get the flake set up real quick. Back on, or next, next. All right. A uh, better way to look up the namespace of an upsynced resource um, backlog, or are you working on this? Uh, well, uh, to be fair, I think we still have to discuss about whether we will we really want to do that or not. Uh, okay. Uh, should I leave it in new, and we'll bring it up in a future community meeting, or do you want to talk about it now? Don't know, Joachim, if you want to, to discuss about it. Um, it's OK yes, if you want to. We need to. Yeah. Well, we, uh, when we upsync a resource, uh, we will need to. So when we upsync the resource, we will need to set some label or annotation to find back the, the actual um, uh, namespace um, of from so as you know downstream when we sync uh, a pod downstream we generate a namespace based on uh, hash we generate a hash based on several information but in some cases that hash has been generated in a different way so the sinker using um, the sinker can use an informer to look up for the proper namespace. But when we upsync a pod, KCP doesn't have um, an informer downstream. We cannot do that because we need to go through sinker. So we need some way to signal from where was that resource upsync to make it, uh, you know. Yeah, so that, that's mainly a, a question of managing migration. If you, if in the KCP server, the logic to generate the physical cluster yeah. namespace changes, and we use this logic on the KCP side to find by the namespace uh, to which uh, we have to communicate with the pod, you know, to, to see the logs, for example, then it would be the wrong one. So we have to mainly store into the upsync uh, pod the namespace, it, the, the downstream namespace. Uh, where it was it was created where it comes from Th that's mainly what it means so mainly maybe mainly maybe we can put that as new and then add that in the epic in the up syncing you know in the pod logs epic because it's it seems to be related to this yeah. type of to this use case there are a number of other you know up syncing 
uh, scenarios where we will not need that. Typically, if you upsync uh, the the PV to move it to another sync target, you don't need to 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 remember this type of things. So I, I think it's mainly related to um, pod upsyncing in the in the case of of the sinker tuneler, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I would say for any namespace at resource that we upsync, we will need something like that. Okay. Well, we will need something like that if we need uh, uh, um, a way back to the to downstream. But if you don't yeah. need a way back to downstream, then you yeah, don't need true. And, and, true, and true. that makes me think it's mainly in the sinker case, in the in the tunneling case. Sorry. Yeah. I'm so gonna put this in the backlog for now. Unless... Yes, true, and we will move that in the right epic okay. uh, later on. Thanks, Sergius. Go ahead. Uh, and now I reminded myself what uh, the allow maximum permission policy issue is all about. So um, for background, today you can define a maximum permission policy on API exports. That is, if you are exporting a type um, and you declare this export within an ex API export, and this API export lives in some workspace, you can define a so-called maximum permission policy based on the local object permissions on your API exported type. And then you can say um, with some convention that only certain you know, groups or certain users are allowed to do certain things on the types that you are exporting. This is cool and works. However, this doesn't work on native types that we have inside KCP, that is config maps, secrets, and so on and so forth, because these things don't have a clear owner today. We discussed this briefly on Slack, um, and uh, there are a couple of um, yeah, possibilities. For instance, we could declare a maximum permission policy on KCP native types and the root workspace um, and some other solutions, but this needs a little bit more thought and also like a more thorough design document, but this is sort of like the background of this issue. Stefan. Yeah, I'm not convinced that we want it. Like, um, why should this be customizable is my question. And um, we have, to my memory, we have a admission plugin which does something like that for a couple of uh, system resources already. So in other words, um, just hard coded in the code, you can yeah, apply any constraints you like. I'm not sure about the value to do that globally and configurable in the root or anything like that. Yeah, um, like th that discussion came up with the um, issue of, you know, exporting actually the API bindings type. That is having, you know, the possibility to bind any type inside a user's workspace. Um, and here came up the discussion that there is currently no way of restricting a maximum permission policy on, you know, KCP, like on native types. Um, I'm totally fine with closing this if we find um, this yeah. is not useful. My, uh, my gut feeling is admission is a thing Yeah, we should yeah. use. Might be. Um, but enough. when it comes to planning, Andy, um, again, like, as you can see from the discussion, there is no clear... <laughs> Like it's not a clear bug. It's not something that is fixable within like a, like one sprint. I would put this in the backlog. To be honest, it, it needs a little bit thought and discussion. If that makes okay, sense. Um, I'm kind of tempted to close it, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's close it then. That's totally fine. Uh, mainly because Stefan was suggesting admission for whatever use cases we come up with, and I think this is maybe ambiguous enough that until we have a concrete use case, I'm not sure that we want to just go and implement this for some unknown future use. Sounds good to me. Less work is better code. OK. Uh, we don't... So we have authorization. It's not a mission for API bindings. Sorry, what was that? Um, I linked it in the in the Slack uh, in the chat. Um, we have an authorization plugin for API bindings to forbid status changes. So it's not admission; it's yes, authorization. Yes, yes, it's indeed yes. At least for status updates. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. 
this is next. All right. Uh, I'm assuming this is either backlog or next. Uh, I'm just assign it to me. It's literally just moving a comment two lines up. <laughs> OK. No, it is assigned to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then clarify workspace privilege group behavior. I'm going to just put that next for you. And this one I know came in. And Vince, you're looking at this right now, right? OK. Cool. All right, that's it for these. And uh, we're close to the end. So unless there's any last minute things, I'm going to suggest we adjourn and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Bye. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Bye.